Yeah. Well, thank you very much for sending the book. I've, yeah, I've, good. It's been sort of like I've read through it once quite quick, and now I've been taking it slow because there's a yeah. there's a lot to it, and um, it's a very individual way. I've never seen permaculture approached in that direction. Uh, uh, almost uh, looking at it as a social movement and more of a global social movement and that was kind of the first question I had is what was what drove you to write the book what um yeah what was your objectives really with with writing it well I I've always been a participant in permaculture for for, for a really long time um and I and like I'm a sociologist and my main area of research is in, in relationship to permaculture has been food security projects in Africa. Uh, it hasn't really been the permaculture movement in Australia, although I, you know, like I've always been a participant in that and gone to the con con convergences and stuff. Anyway, um, someone from Pluna Books asked me to sort of participate, to write something for them because it had a whole series on alternatives and futures, you know, like, and so, um, it's the fireworks series so you know activist movements of the present period and so i and she knew i was involved with permaculture and asked me to write about that and i, and I suppose that's that sort of got me going and i thought oh yeah i could do that you know and it's like my other books I, i've written two other books and it's very hard to get a to get a readership and i thought wow this is an opportunity to write something where i'm likely to get people reading this stuff that i write yeah. And so it's proved, you know, it's certainly true. It's certainly been true. There's been a lot of interest in the book from permaculture people around the world. Yeah. And it is um, a real, from my perspective, permaculture has always been on the fringe. Of course, it's said, and it's one of the things that's taught, it's not a political movement, but it's very fringe <laughs> on the edge of, of being political in a lot of the um, practice that is it, it is a, a social political movement though it doesn't define itself as, as such um, from my perspective well yes and no i mean i think i think permaculture if you read if in the three canonic texts like i talk about the, the the three canonic texts in the book and i mean it's like they all talk about i mean they all talk about ending the industrial system or ending ending industrialism or something like that I mean, really, that's a commitment to system change, you know, and it's like not defined in the same way that the left polit political person would, you know, they don't even use the same word, but it's re it means the same thing. I mean, the left, if, if, you're, if you're on the left and you're pol political, you'll talk about a post-capitalist society or the end ending capitalism and so on, whereas permaculture people don't do that. They talk about ending industrialism, but like... Uh, you know, they envisage industrialism as as a, a system. You know, as modernity, really, um, and 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 consequently, um, there's no doubt about it that permaculture, like the other social movements, like environmentalism or, or, or you know, even the labor movement, in, in wanting to make a, a drastic change in the in the way the way things are organised. And, and and the other thing is, I mean, if you look at um, Bill Mollison's last chapter. You know the famous last chapter in the designer's manual where he talks about what he sees as the alternative it's a pretty radical um platform i mean it's bioregionalism uh it's um communities and like small towns de deciding their own futures democratically and organizing themselves to produce sustain a sustainable society and uh, and, and meeting together to make arrangements to sort of coordinate their actions you know like you know that's quite a, that's quite a, I mean that's quite a radical vision and corresponds to a lot of what Gandhi, for example, was recommending. And uh, there's a, a leftist Marxist Australian sociologist called Ted Trainer. It's not that different to his viewpoint. So, you know, like in the, in the book, I talk about that as the bioregionalism town market model, and it's like yeah, that's pretty well clear in in that chapter. Um, and and Holmgren's similar. You know, you know, I mean, Holcomb has a similar analysis, you know, a broad scale kind of global analysis of where we're going wrong and, and, and how drastically we need to change things. So I, th I think it's not political in the sense that permaculture doesn't believe that this system changes to be achieved by, you know, trying to 
uh, lobby governments to do something different, you know? It's not political in that sense of, of, of aiming to sort of influence party politics. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that, obviously there are members of permaculture who are doing that, but, but I'm, what I'm saying is that the movement as a whole and in its founding text does, I mean, you know, like I talk about famous, you know, the Global Gardener video, and there's this picture of Mollison walking across the misty paddock and, and he's saying, you know, I used to be involved in forest protests to try and stop logging and so on. I realise the protest is insufficient and we need to build a new, the new society from the grassroots up, basically. Yeah. And that's right. like that kind of nails the permaculture political perspective in a way. Yeah. So just to give you a bit more of introduction to permaculture, Kerno, um, yeah, we're based in, in Cornwall. I actually live in Kent. Um, so most of the other directors are in Cornwall and we have a series of community gardens around the Millbrook area, which is uh, south uh, east Cornwall. And we're setting up a series of little community gardens um, as a sort of byproduct of um, the courses, some of the income from the courses, but also through funding. And they're community little hubs. Um, and yeah, the, it, they're also training grounds. So people can actually learn some, some skills and techniques that they can take home and do on their own garden. One of them, yeah. is, one of them is in a school and that's really nice because it's got a nice edge between education it's an educational garden when the school's open for the kids and then it's community garden we've got a nice big greenhouse there so it's a nursery space as well so how are you getting um the land the land for this i mean in who, who's the donor i mean how how are you getting access so to yeah all of them are, are, are leases long-term leases so they're bits of land that exist in the community one part is a farmer's land another one is yeah as i said a, a large school playground field really um and there's another one that is a is not a community garden it's just an educational garden it's one of the primary schools approached us and said hey can you build us a bit of a vegetable garden uh so the kids can plant things so um that's happening there also in kent where i am um quite a few of my students have come to the course from kent area and they're all doing little projects quite similarly so we're all kind of starting to link up uh, different projects that are in this area as well. So when, when the, with these community gardens, who, who are the kind of people who are coming along to them? What sort of, you know, like are they urban nights? They live in towns or they're- Well, rural? mostly they're, so England, except for the big cities, England's got this city sprawl, goes from London, I don't know if you know, all the way up almost to Birmingham. It's one big city sprawl. But on yeah. the periphery of all of that is loads of, villages but they're suburban villages really um yeah and yeah Cornwall's a bit of an outlier Cornwall really is rural but yeah where where we have set up these community gardens is on the edge of Plymouth it's the Cornwall side um of the border well yeah it's on on the periphery of a major city well, yeah so a lot of the time that is as Holgram puts it uh, retro suburbia is a lot of the time is where um, there's a lot of fertility for this type of movement for this change yeah. Um, yeah so yeah that's how it's progressing and we're getting more and more people on the courses but we've changed the course system from being live like this through zoom to uh, a whole series of online courses that they can do at their own pace whenever they feel yeah. and then a weekly check-in that they can join when they feel yeah. um, and that ends up being a bit more like a mentorship program they've got the course they can do it in their own time but I then um, am checking in with them and kind of helping them as individuals and whatever help they need with their personal projects so, so okay so um, yeah that's true. very similar to a friend of mine one of the members of the permaculture Australia committee that's April um, April of Permaculture Visions. She, she runs an online course as, with a similar sort of thing to that. Gotcha. So you're charging people for that? For, it's a yeah. PD is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're doing that. Um, and we're doing a bit of a sort of thing where people who can pay the full amount, they can pay the full amount. But if they can't, they get in touch with us and let us know and we can, we can do it um, for a, a, a lesser sum. So we just try and make it affordable for everyone. So... 
yeah i had another question for you um yeah. did you travel for the interviews or did you do them um o- over online okay so um the the australian ones i managed to do before the covid crisis really hit so i was able to leave melbourne and go up to newcastle and interview old friends of mine from the newcastle district um and um so so that so the australian interviews uh there are a variety of different different pe- people you know like um the, the interviews are, it, with bali um my friend donny um mama was li- was living in australia at the time as a postgraduate student here you know just for a year from indonesia or whatever and he talked to me and then he arranged the Zoom links with the with the other two people from the from the uh, Indonesian Permaculture Organization, and so we did Zooms. And then he, the one with Sayu, he translated because he did we did it together. And like I'd ask the question in English, he'd translate into into Indonesian, and then and then they discuss it, and then he'd give me a rundown. And then later on, he translated the, the transcribed the whole thing in, into Indonesian and also English. So that was how that went. And the African interviews, um, they were all done when I was over it with the Chukukwa project in 2000 and, um, 2014 and 2010. So that, so they're ancient interviews, but I but I use I re- use them again. You know, like so when I started. Okay, so that those ones, and then the UK and the United States ones in Norway, they're all done by Zoom. Yeah, yeah. I looked at the Chukua video that you. Oh, looked, good. And it's very nice. Yeah, and I, it's like this is there's only a few people on this, but there's going to be a lot of people who wanted the recording of this, so I'll send that out. So I suggest any of you want to watch that. That's a, a really nice thing to watch. Um, especially because of the fact that it's not just about land, but it's also about this um, conflict re- resolution side to things. Um, and and yeah, I'd like you to sort of also elaborate on how um, how your almost uh, social um, yeah sociology has helped you in the in the progress of of those sorts of projects. Um, yeah, well, I mean, in, in terms of the African stuff, like I, I was always uh, like it started off because I was I had some African students doing a master's of um, social change and development. And like um, because of my interest in agriculture and, and because a lot of them were agri- initially they were agricultural extension officers, first from South Africa, but then later from other African countries. So. I started to talk to them about their projects, you know, and what, how were their projects working and stuff like that. And that led me to go over there and, and first in 2006 and then in later years um, to look at projects in different parts of that part, you know, that a region of Africa. And, and yeah, I mean, I was interested in, I mean, I, because of permaculture, I had a fair knowledge of the different kinds of technologies they were using in agricultural technologies. And what was available to people who didn't have an, enough income to buy inputs, and you know, you, you know, were having maybe having trouble with irrigating their crops as well, you know, because they didn't have enough money to pay for proper irrigation and stuff. Uh, and so, that was a sort of technological or agricultural science basis of it all. And but in terms of the social stuff, well, clearly a lot of the projects were failing because they were not really well adapted to the to the social context. And, and, you know, like, and like, and so meeting people and talking to them and, you know, interviewing people, it was definitely the way to go and, and you know, going around doing this sort of, lo- a sort of, you know, an ethnography where you actually, and like I lived in various villages and that was really terrific and really necessary. I wouldn't have had have the understanding that I have if I hadn't done that, you know. So that's like an anthropological technique, tech, you know, method, if you like. Yeah, kind of laying your roots down a bit before. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I used to, like, like when I first got there in 2006, I was living in a rural village where people were doing a lot of subsistence agriculture, um, where, where it wasn't market, you know, it wasn't market agriculture, where, um, 
and and so I I had an assist a young assistant who spoke the local language as well as English, and I'd just go out to the farmers' fields and 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 hang about and go and see what they were doing and talk to them about it, and you know, that, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. yeah, so along your pathway and writing the book and having so many interviews, one thing I, I, I'll say as a feedback on the book, it's amazing how you took all those interviews and you actually um, laid them in an order which was actually graspable <laughs> in a way. You took different uh, interviews and and put them on different subject lines, subject headings, and took excerpts from each interview. Um, I, I found that very, yeah, a very interesting approach. Rather than just this is that person's interview, this is that person's interview, you you broke it down into its subject uh, context, which was which was great. Um, but yeah, over the whole time it took you to write the book and get all those interviews. Um, did you get like a, a wider sort of vision of the overall movement globally? Did you feel that you, was it very eye-opening, the, the journey you went on? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I, um, I, I, think that, I think the movement in the UK and Australia and the United States are somewhat similar. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I basically say that what, what, what they are is mainly middle class activists who who come basically come from the left and they want it you know they're not happy with the way the current system's working out both in terms of sustainability and social justice and they see permaculture as a strategy for for developing system change that's very engaging you know and, and, and doesn't make you feel depressed all the time it gives you hope you know like that they they like that about it you know i'd say that and and i think i think for those people there are two, kind of two issues that are coming up for them one one is like how how do we broaden permaculture out to 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 include people from different class backgrounds and different ethnic backgrounds you know really important question for them you know like this is even within the context of these kind of uh, metropole countries, these rich countries, like, okay. And, and you know, I like you, the, the stuff that you're doing with community gardens is an example of how, how that might be done. And I say that I talk about that in the book um, and that's happening everywhere, you know, like in Australia, in the United States and, and, and also just people becoming more aware of, the, of, of what, what's involved with their class position and how it restricts them in it and okay and the second issue that they're coming up with is you know what other kinds of political engagement other than this sort of grassroots permaculture practice should would be involved in if any you know and a lot of people are uh, in permaculture I mean some as I say some of the people in permaculture are going this is the kind of activism that really works for me emotionally uh, and 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 being involved in kind of more explicit political stuff, I find depressing. And other permaculture people are saying, I want to combine my permaculture activism with linking up with other social movements that are maybe working more directly on political issues. So, okay, so that's the rich world, if you like. Now, now in the in the developing world, it's like. I don't know. I mean, it's different in in Indonesia and, and, and Africa, so it's hard to compare them. I mean, in a, okay, so so permaculture internationally. I mean, a lot of people from from rich per, permaculture countries have gone to the global south to do de, what you might call development work. I mean, that's probably a bad term, but it, but it, but you know, aid work, let's say, right and. And as well as that, there are local people who are from the middle class, whether they're indigenous people or, or, they're, or they're from the colonizing country, you know, like in Zimbabwe, there might be white people from originally from, from Europe. But, or, but, in, but in Indonesia, there are Indonesians living, you know, like local Indonesians. And, 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 and often there's a combo, you know, like there's both, you know, like there's black middle class people working on permaculture in, in South Africa and you know, and, and Vietnam and wherever, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, yeah. it's not just, it's not just the sort of um, 
yeah, anyway. And, and I like it, but, but what, what the, the groups that these people are working with are, are often, you know, subsistence farmers or, 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 or even tribal people who are, who are living, who are doing some sort of um, cropping, a commercial cash cropping like for coffee or something like that. Uh, but they they what they need they're running into problems with the market economy and they need and they're not getting a good good adequate food they might be destroying their forest uh, they they may have various problems of decreasing soil fertility uh, and so on and permaculture people are, are kind of moving into sort of to to assist here and, and see what what permaculture can offer and um, and I think that you know all I'd say about that is yeah there are these that's another that's another that's another way that permaculture is working in the world as as part of a global global movement, and 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 you know it can it, it can be both you know and, it, and and in a sense these two different parts of the movement in the rich countries and then in the global south are, are complementary to each other, you know. It, 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 um, yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like the. The, the, the movement in the rich countries, which is sort of mainly a middle class movement and, 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 dot, and dot, 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 you know, you could say all that, is, 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 is kind of providing funding, but also resources and educational resources and, and people who are prepared to go and work in, in the global south. Um, so these two parts of the movement kind of relate to each other in a way. That is also great. is a, a question, uh, there's a few questions come up, but one is the global, yeah, the, as you would say, global north, but yeah, the overdeveloped countries really. Yeah. Um, what I find with, so a, a fair few of my students have become teachers, but quite a few of them do not want to say the word permaculture. So they want to teach and they teach ecological gardening or allotment. Uh, self-sufficiency or whatever they've given themselves a, a, a line that they'll go on but they don't want to and this might just be an English thing but a lot of the time you say the word permaculture and straight away there's um, almost uh, a kind of um, cynic cynicism from the people that you're working with so uh, um, yeah one uh, one person I'm mentoring for at the moment was um, just gave me an email and said that was one of the problems he was coming up against. He, in allotments, he was teaching a whole load of people, giving them David Holgram's principles, and and they were loving it, but he just didn't want to say that word. So, I don't know why that is something. I think in both sides of the, a lot of people that approach our course are from Extinction Rebellion, for instance, or from the Green Party, or from. Like they're already in that line and they're open-minded enough to, to accept permaculture as something uh, that is useful to them. Um, but I think on both sides, like you see in the, as you say, the left movements, you see a sort of um, cynicism towards permaculture, but also I think through permaculture movements, there's also a bit of a closed-mindedness towards encompassing other groups and organizations. Um, and what would you like? I don't know if you've come up, up against that in Australia, um, but what would you say is the main sort of steps forward for developing this movement to actually get to a point where we are linking up more of our efforts with with people, as you put in the book very clearly, uh, with more of the people that are aligned with permaculture uh, ethics and principles, even if they're not saying they're permaculture. Yeah, well, I, I think I think it's very um, it, it's important to distinguish what's going on in different parts of the world. Okay, so I, I, I think that in particular in this, which is probably relevant to you guys in the UK, is that agroecology and degrowth are, are the ways in which these kind of politics are expressed in Europe. Yeah, more so than permaculture. Not yeah. saying that there isn't a permaculture Europe movement in Europe. There is. But it's like agroecology agro and and you know yeah. degrowth are the terms that are mostly used by the movements in Europe which are pursuing the similar objectives to permaculture. I think it's important for permaculture people to recognise that, and 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 in a way, it's a done deal. There's not much can be done about that. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, and the other the other thing I think is that it's happening, is, and and this is more of a global phenomenon, is that people, um, the term agroecology is being promoted by universities as a scientific approach to sustainable agriculture, and permaculture is being, in in the process, permaculture gets gets put in the box of you know, like a hippy dippy cult or something, you know, like it's like, I mean, in, 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 in fact, there's, there's not that much to separate, really. No. no. Um, and, but I also think this is not, in, in, to a degree, this is not politically an accident in the sense that there are various things about perma, the politics of permaculture uh, in the canonic books, which a lot of the environment movement and the mainstream environment movement finds unpalatable, and the, like okay, and you know, like I list them, and I think well, I think I think they're really uh, central to permaculture's books, canonic books. One is um, the emphasis on perennials. You know, like okay, you know, like it, at the very least, permaculture plans to have a mix a mixed system whereby carbohydrates are supplied both by perennials and by annuals, right? So, yeah. so, 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 whereas in the organics movement or in agroecology, you don't get that kind of emphasis. In permaculture, you get the idea that we need to build, rebuild the forests and, 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 and create, you know, um, fertility through, through, through centuries of forest occupation. And that we humans have to live in, in harmony with that kind of structure, at least to a large extent, right? So one. The second thing is decentralization. You know, permaculture people tend not to believe in, in large urban centers. I mean, the, main, no, the mainstream environmentalist movement, it's much too radical for them. And they know that if they say to the average person, oh, we all need to move out into the country, they're going to be horrified and throw up their hands and saying that's impossible. You know, okay, so there's that. That's the second thing. The third thing is the emphasis on political decentralization, a sort of some kind of some version of of community control and, and anarchist control over the means of production. I mean, I could debate the fine print on that, but 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 there's an emphasis on that kind of politics in permaculture, which again you don't find in the mainstream. A lot of environmentalists want top-down regulation and control by the state. You know, like and and so there's. And not that some permaculturists aren't going along with that as well, but you, well, all I'm saying is that that's a, that's a, a dimension of difference. And what what's the, the last thing? Oh, degrowth. Yeah. I mean, you know, like it's almost no accident that in Europe, agroecology and degrowth are two separate things. You know, like degrowth is for the people who are extreme environmentalists and realize that we've got energy descent and that we can't actually live like this anymore, right? That's a minority. But there are a lot of people who are into sustainable agriculture. So agroecology takes them in without without burdening them with the degrowth side of things. You know, like whereas permaculture, it's all in together. You know, like it, 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 a key plank of permaculture is, is to what Holmgren refers to as energy descent. And that's also present in, in the designer's manual and the other books, you know, like Bill Mollison's book, uh, you know, the first book and, and the second book, the designer's manual. It's, it's in them as well. And like, I think, and clearly there's a minority of the environmentalist movement that understands the necessity for degrowth in that sense. But there's a lot of people who just like throw up their hands and they go, you know, you can talk about degrowth in the rich countries, but what about in the poor country? I mean, they've got all sorts of, mistaken ideas about the degrowth movement but okay so 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 there's all that right that's one set of problems in other words there's actually a real political difference between permaculture and some of these mainstream environmentalist movements and no wonder they're skeptical about permaculture they've got reason to be skeptical because in terms of their politics so that's one thing that's going on but the other things that are going on are, are things maybe we could do something about which i think and like I argue this very strongly in the book, which is that I think the definition of permaculture is very off-putting or it's very mysterious. You know, and I, I say that. I think most permaculture people I interviewed, and, and, and certainly I think this is true internationally, not just in Australia, but certainly in the rich countries, not so much in the poor countries, it's different. 
But in the rich countries, permaculture is defined in terms of David Holmgren's last book, Principles and Pathways. Yeah. And what yeah. David says about it is, well, okay, what's different from about permaculture is not just about sustainable agriculture. It's about sustainable everything, right? Yeah. And then the question then is, well, why don't you just call it environmentalism? Because surely that's what the environmentalist movement is on about, yeah. sustainability. Yeah. You might have a different idea of, of about sustainability from them, but basically you're arguing for a particular version of environmentalism. And David says, the answer is systems theory. Permaculture is about design, right? And it's about systems theory. You know, a holistic understanding of, of, of whatever problem you're looking at. Now, in a way, I mean, they're not entirely bad answers or anything, but it's like I would say in crit, com, I'd make two critical points. One is you'd be an idiot if you were an environmentalist and you weren't designing things, you know, right? So, so in a, it doesn't really ser, deal with that problem. Why, why don't you call yourself an environmentalist? And the second thing is, similarly with systems theory, if systems theory is relevant, every environmentalist should be aware of it. And maybe that's, but it doesn't really distinguish permaculture from environmentalism more broadly. The other problem is that the reality, you know, when you interview permaculture people about their careers, they talk about sustainable agriculture. That's what they're doing. Like, like you just said at the beginning of this discussion, what are you doing these days? Oh, well, we're setting up community gardens, right? You know, oh, I've got a small business and I'm going around landscaping people's gardens, or I'm involved in a community supported agriculture farm, or I'm part of an intentional community and, and we're doing sustainable agriculture to feed ourselves through subsistence agriculture, or I'm working in the developing in, in the global yeah, south and, and I'm looking at people's food security needs and the problems they're having with that. There's this mismatch between permaculture as it's defined by people and what people actually practice. And I think that in itself leads to distrust because what happens is if I'm outside the permaculture movement, I'm just a general environmentalist and I ask someone in permaculture, what is permaculture? And they give me this whole confusing rave about systems theory and, you know, it's a design science and, they, and it's based on a set of principles and they start telling you the principles and you go, duh, I mean, is that surprising? I don't know, catch and store energy, uh, catch a yield, you know, like store energy, use renewal. I mean, they go, yeah, right. I'm still not quite getting this. Here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no wonder, I mean, no wonder they're skeptical. If you just said to them, permaculture is a populist science, a social movement based on sustainable agriculture. And we also have particular ideas about the environmental crisis that aren't shared with the rest of the environmentalist movement. You'd be doing permaculture a great service in my view. Yeah. Because, because the problem is at the moment is people, when you ask people what permaculture is, they don't give you back a square deal. They don't tell you, you know, they won't, they don't, the first thing that comes into their, into that they'll to say to you it isn't, isn't the most important thing, which is we more, mainly talk about sustainable agriculture. And so it's like, I know, no wonder people think it's a cult. It's like Christians, you know, and they come to your door, you know, what do you want about? Oh, you know, you know what I mean? They won't tell you instantly. It like takes ages to find out. Permaculture is a bit like that. Now that's there. I mean, that's a bit, I've probably gone over the top more than I, I, I normally would, but you know, oh, I like, understand. Um, it is. It's one of those things. And it also with the students that like, I get them at the beginning of the course before they've even started the introduction to just give me a definition what they know of permaculture anyway. What, what yeah. is it? And I get them to do that at the beginning and I get and they come up with something. They come up with something that's normally always in line with permaculture. And then towards the end of the course, I ask them again. Now come up with your definition. And nearly always they find it much harder at the end of the course <laughs> than at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. it's too yeah. vast. That's the, that's the vast. biggest thing. It's a yeah. vast um, subject. And it's ever-expanding. I had also a, 
conversation with the UK Association where they were trying to make permaculture um, go into university and schools. And I, I, I agree with that, but they wanted to standardize it. And they got all the teachers from all over Europe together to write a list of all the subjects they think must be in a permaculture design course. And my, uh, like, and I was on the team doing the statistics, getting the numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, as they were doing this sort of presentation of it, I said, well, I'd like to just give a little point. One thing I'm saying is we might find that this whole effort is obsolete in less than two years because the subject is expanding, guys. It, it's expanding so exponentially that there's going to be subjects that in five, ten years we're not teaching because they're too obvious and other ones that have come in that are completely new. Like, how do you apply permaculture to marine regeneration? There's a new subject coming in now. And so this is something that as a teacher, you're never going to get totally the, the subject unless you're constantly researching and constantly yeah. updating your lesson plans. Yeah. Because there's more and more to it as, as time goes on. Um, and it's like, yeah, but it's like, it's interesting your example. I mean, it's like marine regeneration it's like a kind of farming, you know, like, and it's like, and no wonder it kind of gets attached on the edge of permaculture. On the other hand, it could, you could equally say, well, new ways to make cement without using fossil fuels. Is that part of permaculture? And it's like, in a way, in terms of David Holmgren's definition, no reason it can't be. No. And so no wonder the field expands infinitely because it's like, how to how to how to what technologies to use to create sustainability and what social and and PIMCOC people will also say we also need to look at the social organizational forms that will allow a sustainable society you know like let, let's put it like that so that also opens up a vast can of worms a vast yeah. area of the possibilities you know ranging from guest out therapy to you know to antibiotics i mean it's like yeah uh, you know to to capitalism or something you know it's like what, what kind of economics to use and and i and i yeah and so that so that's, that's why it's, you know like I, I suppose you know like in those opening chapters of my book i try and think of a way to, to kind of narrow it down to what we actually do most yeah yeah and i think you know, I think that's a sustainable agriculture, and and b it's just about you know a, four, a list of about four points that 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 permaculture people tend to share in, which which are not shared by a large group of the environmentalist community. Yeah, you know, I think permaculture is a, a sub movement within the environmentalist movement. Yeah, what kind of sub movement is it? One sustainable agriculture, two belief in energy descent and so on perennials yeah, whatever yeah okay leslie do you have a question for terry yeah i'm just thinking in terms of um the definition of permaculture certainly with my background there's always been a difficulty with the definition of sustainable as well so I don't know what your thoughts are on that, and um, because I think we're moving, tending to move more towards regenerative rather than sustainable now. Ah, uh, I don't mind sustainable that much. I mean, I, I take the point made by David Holmgren in discussing this that. Um, you know you you can create a particular technology to deal with a particular problem and having dealt with that problem you may not want to continue using that technology so you know talking about it as sustainable implies a sort of permanence and it's always going to be the same and you're going to do the same thing year after year after year it's going to be the same yeah, I think that's a, that can be a problem with the term sustainable. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm happy to go with regenerative. Um, I mean, 
look, you know, like, okay, so, so look, I, I, I look at it like this. Okay, so the first thing I'd say is one, one way of looking at environmentalism is to say, what kinds of economic practices of, of human societies are going to undermine the foundations of continuing to, to engage in those economic practices in the future? You know, like, so, okay, so we're plowing a field every year and every year the topsoil is getting less and less and, and, and eventually that technology can no longer be used and, and, the, and, the, and the benefits we're getting out of that field in terms of food will no longer be sustained. So like that, that's one issue with an environmentalism, right? There's another issue in environmentalism, which is care for the, for the planet, you know, like, and it's like permaculture always combines these. You know, it's like, it's like it, it, again, this is a, if you like, this is something distinctive in, about permaculture compared with the environmentalist movement, is that it, it tries to take both of these things into consideration rather than prioritizing one over the other. So, so you know, like in terms of the, the, the term regenerative suggests to me, we're going to look after other species on the planet and not just humans. And, uh, and, and, and like, for me, for me personally, I mean that's a strong part of what I how I identify as an environmentalist. You know, I, that, I take that very seriously, and I like permaculture because of because it, it says, well, okay, how can we bring about a food system which which both looks after other species and also provides for the needs of of, of people, um, and, and in a way that we can continue to provide for our needs in the future. You know, so it, it sort of joins all these things together. Um, so yeah, that's where I'd be, stand on on all of these kind of related issues. I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, that brings us sort of to this uh, question, like, and I think uh, it has a impact on lots of people who are doing permaculture all over the globe. Um, is how do you think we fund this change? Uh, because. I know some of the um, some of the people that have done permaculture for way longer than me and have taught, and and normally they're always just getting by. <laughs> they might be growing a lot of things uh, in their land, but financially they're just getting by. And so, um, yeah, I, well, Bill Mollison's the he there was a great. Um, audio which was funding the revolution maybe you've come across it a long time ago might not be available anymore but um yeah he was talking about that really more or less permaculturalists now we want to become not just agriculturalists but economists because we do need to approach that elephant in the room which is an economy which is self-destructive uh, our economic system is set out almost to exploit people, exploit the planet, and not really share with anyone <laughs> in the process, uh, privatize wealth. So what do you see about the sort of funding the change and the economic system? Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. Well, 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 well. The first, the first thing I say about it, you know, like you know, and I talk about this in the book, is that um, the way permaculture in practice is funded <clears throat> is through using the discretionary income of the middle class of the rich countries, and and also of the um, the global south as well, the middle class of those countries too, and that the way late capitalism has been set up and especially through the period of the welfare state and so on is to improve the, the, the wages and the affluence of the working class um, and, and the middle class, like on top of that, their wages and affluence in, increased as well to the point where they have a certain amount of discretionary income. And, and like permaculture trades on that and says, well, okay, you can use that discretionary income to buy a bigger car or a larger house or something. So, but but it's probably more engaging and more fun to be involved in, you know, a project of transforming our society to a more sustainable one. So 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 clearly that's one of the ways in which the environmentalist movement works. And I bet I know I think that people should acknowledge that and not you know, not try and hide that. You know, like that to go yeah that's what we're doing and that's fine. 
Yeah. So, so that's the first thing I'd say about it. The second thing I'd say is, you know, a whole lot of obvious things, you know, pe people that use crowdfunding or, or they set up a cooperative or there, there, are, all, there are all sorts of different sort of eco economic techniques for, for, for kind of making that, making that discretionary income work to create social change. You know, like, I don't think anything I could say about that would be new to people, you know, like it's like it's, it's all pretty obvious. The third thing I'd say about it is, you know, like you've got to look at permaculture. In my view, the, the, only, the only way to set up a sustainable society is not to have money at all and to have a gift economy. You know, like, so, so what, I, what, what I think is that what permaculture people do in practice is prefiguring um, the economy of the future is through making hybrids of capitalism and the gift economy. So that, so that the practices that they engage in make use of some of the, you know, some of the aspects of the, of the current capitalist economy with some aspects of the gift economy. And, and, and it's like, for example, the community supported agriculture farm, right? So, so on the one hand, what, what you've got is the customers who are sort of spending slightly more money than they would at the supermarket. And they're also uh, giving to giving, you know, it's a kind of gift because they're actually taking the trouble to uh, organizational trouble to just get a box of veggies and the dis inconvenience of just having a box of random veggies rather, rather than the ones you pick out at the supermarket and all sorts of things like that. And they're doing that for the sake of the planet on the one hand, or, or you know, or to create a more uh, um, convivial work environment for the people working in the cooperative that's running the farm. And now, okay, so that's their, their, from them, their point of view. And then let, let's look at the people who are involved in the farming themselves. Well, they're, sac they're sacrificing some of their possible income as middle-class people by, by engaging in a project which is creative. You know, they're getting that out of it in a way that they wouldn't out of a normal job. But they're, and they're also enjoying a much better, richer social life through working as a team with people rather than just under a boss who's telling you what to do all, all the time. Um, and 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 there are, or, and the third thing is they're expressing their love for the planet by looking after the, you know, looking after the the, the Earth's resources for, for you know for, for the for the biota and also for, for humans in the future. You know, like so so in a sense, I, I I think unfortunately within the context of a capitalist economy, it's 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 inevitable that those kind of decisions will come with with various financial costs. The market is, you know, the, the unsustainable practices that we find in the market are designed to make the maximum possible profit. That's what that's why they happen. Uh, and 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 if you depart from those unsustainable practices, you'll suffer market sanctions. You know, in other words, you'll get less money for what you're doing than someone who's who's doing it the other, you know, the the, the unsustainable way. Um, so yeah. Yeah, our system is currently yeah a, a neo-capitalist model, meaning that um, those that are polluting and doing it on a very large scale are being not only paid by us consuming from them if we consume from them, but also are getting a governmental subsidy in most instances. So the polluters are getting paid to pollute. And currently, small scale farmers who want to have a startup fund find it very, very hard to even get a loan from a bank. So yeah. our current system is, yeah, is not enabling the people that really need to be enabled in this time. People who are locking down carbon from the atmosphere, people who are cleaning up rivers and cleaning up the soil and enabling those that are, are not are doing the opposite. So, yeah, there's... Um, it's kind of I agree with those three systems you're say, saying, but there is a political side to it because we can never um, really change if we've got a model which is taking our taxes and putting it to where we don't want it. <laughs> it's like where we where we currently know that those guys are not doing good with it, really. A certain amount of our taxes right now are probably going to warfare somewhere in the world, for instance. So it it's it's very hard it's an uphill struggle the way we're going currently so that i'm just saying if you if 
any of us had any idea on how to shift the political motivation and mo movement, make the polluters pay and make those that are, are cleaning up, uh, give them help. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, it's different in different countries. I mean, okay, so in, in Australia, we have a preferential voting system which means in a minority party like the Greens, it makes sense to give them your first vote. And then you give the second vote to the Labor Party, right? Which you know is not do, going to do a great deal for the environment, but it's better than the Conservatives, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. like that, that all works and it, and, it crea and it creates the Greens in Australia as a sort of pressure lobby group, which is pushing the Labor Party to the left always, you know, as, or to, in a more environmentalist direction, let's say. Yeah. That's yeah. happening, right? In a first-past-the-post system like you've got in the UK, if you vote for the Green Party here, you waste your vote. You know, like, yeah, yeah. So there's a big disincentive. The same is true in the United States. Uh, Europe's completely different. It's more almost all proportional representation. So, And then the danger is, like, the German Greens, it gets the party gets completely co-opted by, you know, by, by cap... Oh, I don't know by light green you know light green cap pro capitalist forces let's yeah. say something like that. and it's like i don't i know i mean so so in a sense to re responding to this situation politically depends where you are you know Cle clearly in australia there's some future in joining the green party or voting green or whatever whereas in the uk it's probably better to be involved in some kind of lobby group to try and get the labor party to give more support to cooperative farms and small farms and so on. So it, these are immediate immediate solutions. And, 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 and but I don't think, I, I think like, I think we're in a moment of crisis globally at the moment. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm in favor, you know, I, I, I think we should be promoting um, a non-monetary, non-market socialism, if you like, in, and, um, and advocating and promoting that as the only way forward. Like I, I'll just explain briefly why I think that. I mean, okay, so so within within a market economy and, a, and especially within a capitalist market economy, what what you have is firms competing with each other to to make to make money. I mean, the the basic idea of money is that you you know um, you sell deer and buy sheep. And, and money doesn't actually work if everyone behaves differently with it than that. That's how that's the sort of hegemonic discourse of how money operates. And, and the capital, the capitalist, the, the owner of a firm, you know, whoever it is, has got an interest in, in making the maximum profit. So what they do always is they externalize their costs. You know, in other words, the community, like if they if their workers are are massively stressed out and going home and having headaches and just vegging out in front of the TV and they're bored out of their brain. That's not their problem, right? So they externalize that cost. They do the same stuff with the environment because, you know, at the, at the end, if the, now if they don't behave that way, what happens then is that some other firm will come in and undercut them on, in yeah. the market. And so this, I, I regard this problem as like essential to any market economy. And I don't think reforming the market by extra regulation from above, um, a vast bureaucratic nightmare of extra controls over prices and, and what you do and environmental controls and so on, is really solving the problem. And we can see now, you know, we've had enough experience of the last you know, 50 to 100 years that it doesn't, that, that, that there's a limit to what you can do. You know, it's better than nothing, but it's not going to get us where we need to be at the moment when, when we've got this huge global crisis and so i'm you know like that's that that's my kind of politics at the moment but i don't uh at the same time i, I you know i respect people who who want to be part of the green party or they 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 want to push a reformist sort of agenda because they think that's more likely to get political support i can understand why they're doing that and 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 i don't really think it's necessarily going to have any bad effects but i but it's it's not it's not where i'm at at the moment i'm i'm trying to to get people to sort of realize we need to do something much more drastic than that yeah i i often say so going in line with what you were saying before and now i often say the the vote that makes the biggest difference is where we actually spend our time and our money where we where we 
what we're actually consuming and what we're actually doing with our action. Um, yeah, and it has, it's been something that, um, it's been an uphill struggle, but has been something that every step in that progress is a great reward. And you do, you attract people who, um, who align with you. Um, and I think that's, that's something that is really, for me personally, um, why I set up Permaculture Kono and why I'm actually linking up projects and things like that is because I think that's the thing that will make a real difference to this movement, move, movement globally is the more strong links between us, the more... Yeah, I to totally agree with that. I, yeah. I think one of the things that permaculture has to offer the world at the moment is, is grassroots activism to tr to try and you know use whatever little gaps you can find in the system to make to make improvements in the way we do things to provide models of sustainability that that can be taken up more broadly as as we get more support uh, and to show that this is an enjoyable way to live and that it makes sense yeah great